All right, sorry to have another online lecture versus an in-person lecture, but given the attendance was so poor, I probably would have ended up doing an online lecture for tomorrow's lecture anyway, so might as well just let you guys sleep in and we can just do an online lecture for tomorrow. And hopefully this is the last of the uh, fire interruptions. So today I wanna to wrap up momentum and talk a little bit about the center of mass, which is yet another way of thinking about conservation of momentum. Now to review, we've talked about that the momentum of an object can be defined as the object's mass times the object's velocity. Momentum is a vector and it points in the same direction as the velocity vector throw back to the second exam. That was the answer to number 10, that the momentum points in the same direction as the velocity vector. We can define for a system of particles, an extended body of particles, maybe it's an object, you know, like a box, which is composed of trillions and trillions of, of atoms, or a star cluster that has several, several stars orbiting around each other, or just three objects that we want to define our system. We can define the momentum of the system as the sum of the momentum vectors of every object, every particle that's in the system. And we saw last time, as a consequence of Newton's third law, if the external, if the net external force on the object, or sorry, on the system is zero, then that resulted in the total momentum of the system being a constant. That is, if the external forces exert a net force of zero on the system, then the time derivative of the total momentum of the system is zero. The momentum does not change for the entire system. Objects within the system can change their momentum. You know, again, going back to the example of, say, the Earth going around the sun, or, or um, you know, if that were our system, we could define that as a closed system where there are no external forces acting on the on the system momentum is then conserved but the momentum of the sun and the earth individually do change as they orbit around each other in that particular case their directions change so the momentum vectors are constantly changing direction and therefore the momentum vector is constantly changing in those cases and because the earth is not on a perfectly circular orbit sometimes the earth is moving faster sometimes the earth is moving slower and then vice versa for the sun all right, and again, since this is a vector equation, or momentum rather is a vector, the conservation of momentum is a momentum is a vector equation, which means that this expression can be true in multiple dimensions or maybe even just one particular dimension. If it's the case where the external forces add up to zero in only one dimension, then momentum is conserved in that dimension only and not conserved in the other dimension. So you can apply this to each dimension individually when you are solving problems. And so just to, I think, review some of the topics that we've talked about so, so far, you know, imagine I have a ball that I throw up against a wall and I throw it in such a way so that it rises, reaches a max height, and then begins to fall back down towards the wall there is a point where it comes in contact with the wall and then rebounds. And then once it loses contact with the wall, continues on a trajectory determined by gravity. Now from start to finish, you know, if I call this start and this finish, momentum is not conserved between these two points because if our system in this case is the ball, there is an external force acting on the system the entire time, that is gravity. However, if we define our system as the wall and the ball during this very brief moment of time during the collision, then we can make the impulse approximation and assume that the external forces, since this interaction occurs over such a short period of time, the external forces really do not have any time to change the momentum of the system and we can apply the conservation of momentum. In this case, we could actually not, we don't even really need to make that approximation because if the collision with the wall is entirely in the horizontal direction, then we could just apply the conservation of momentum during the collision in the horizontal direction. And since gravity is always working in the vertical direction, it is constantly changing the momentum in the vertical direction. You know, if we were to plot, say, you 
is a function of time, the force in the y direction, then that entire time, the force is equal to negative 9.8, meters per second squared times the mass of the ball, even during that short period of time when the ball is in contact with the wall. And so as a result, the momentum of the ball in the y direction as a function of time, in this case, begins positive, becomes negative, and even during the time when it collides with the wall, you know, maybe that's this point right here. You know, the collision with the wall doesn't really do anything because that collision, that collision impulse force is happening entirely in the horizontal direction. Versus, if I were to do the same thing, but in the horizontal direction, you know, the force in the horizontal direction is zero when it is not in contact with the wall, when it is in contact with the wall, there is an extremely large force that occurs over a very short amount of time. And so as a result, let me draw some dots down. So as a result, if I were to do the momentum of the ball in the horizontal direction, it was, it's starting moving towards the wall with some positive horizontal uh, velocity, therefore it's a horizontal momentum. It comes in contact with the wall. The momentum of the object is very quickly changed during the rebound, and it moves back away from the wall at some constant horizontal, uh, some constant negative velocity in the horizontal direction. Again, assuming that to the right is positive and to uh, up is positive in these cases. I did not quite draw these to scale, but then obviously that corresponds to that, that corresponds to that. And just to tie this in, you know what's going on here. Also remember that the way we can define the change of momentum, in this case in the x direction, is just the same thing as the impulse that's being, a, that's a applied in the x direction, which is just the horizontal forces integrated over time. Force times a time changes momentum. Unlike work, which is force over distance changes energy. And here we're just looking at the x component, which is why I did not draw vectors, but in general also remember that the change in momentum is just equal to the impulse which is the integral of the force vector over time. And that's true for any interaction. You know, who care? You know, this is saying nothing about conservation laws. This is always true. Um, so any interaction, we can apply this. You know, think like like how we said the work energy theorem can always be applied no matter what's going on. This equation that I've circled, if we think about that as the momentum impulse relation. And that can always be applied, but it's when all the for all the net the net external forces add up to zero that we can then apply a conservation law, the conservation momentum. All right, so we ended last time where we briefly talked about uh, inelastic collisions. So these are collisions between two objects where the kinetic energy is not conserved. So while the total initial momentum equals the total final momentum, the initial kinetic energy is less than, oh, sorry. The initial kinetic energy is greater than the final kinetic energy. Energy is lost uh, in the process. Work is done during the collision. Usually it, this results in heat being generated. Or in the case of, say, um, 
a ball colliding with a wall, for example, if I, if I threw a cue ball at, at the wall, there would be a very loud cracking noise. That, that sound is also energy, so that would be an example of how energy is lost from the system during the collision. And everyday, everyday interactions in nature are typically always inelastic, but then there are some cases where we can approximate the collision as being an elastic collision. And this is the case where the kinetic energy is conserved. So not only can I say the initial momentum equals the final momentum, I can also say the initial kinetic energy equals the final kinetic energy of the system. Um, this is useful because if this is the case, this provides another constraint that involves, that involves both the mass and the velocity of the objects. So usually when the collision is elastic, that gives us additional information that allows us to solve for some of the unknown variables. Otherwise, we have to either get the variables through just conservation momentum, or we have to do some sort of experimental measurement in order to get the resulting values um, during the collision. So let's say I'm out of space. So let's move to the next slide. So we had the one example in class um, that came with a demo of you have some object that collides with some other large object, you know, which itself might have a velocity. Maybe it's moving towards the object. Maybe it's moving away, but at a slower speed so that they do collide. You know, so there could be some velocity of the big object as well. And then they, you know, they collide and then they stick together and move as one unit afterwards. And so during this collision, this is a case where this is the most extreme case of an inelastic collision um, because it's completely inelastic in that they stick together. They become one object at the end of the day. So in this case, then the mass, you know, if I do this entirely in one dimension, so I don't have to worry about vectors, the mass of the first object times the velocity of the first object plus the mass of the second object times the velocity of the second object then equals the sum of the two masses times the final velocity of the objects moving together. Or that the final velocity, once the objects collide and move together, is the sum of the momentum divided by the sum of the mass. Now, I'm Again, not a fan of us deriving all these equations and then you memorizing every equation thinking that they all stand for a unique separate disparate thing. Again, this is just an application of the conservation momentum for completely inelastic collisions. What is nice though is that you can, you know, with stuff like this, I like to qualitatively look at the equation and see if the equation can qualitatively tell me something about the motion of the objects after the collision occurs. For example, I could ask if the two objects are moving with some velocity, can I, can this equation tell me something about when they collide and stick together, what direction are the objects going to be moving in? And so what direction the object ends up moving in, since you know, I did not write this as a vector equation, but I technically could have if this was, a, if this was occurring in multiple, multiple dimensions. You know, the direction of the final velocity depends on whether the numerator here is positive or negative. So it depends on whether when I add up the mass times the velocity of object one plus the mass times the velocity of object two, if that is positive, then it's pointing towards, you know, whatever my positive direction my coordinate system is. If it's negative, it points in the opposite direction. Uh, so in these cases, I like to look at extreme limits. So I could say, you know, if, and if I said maybe the magnitude of, the, of one of them is much, much greater than the magnitude of the other. So suppose I have, you know, 
a ball that is moving with with some large velocity, or maybe it's a very massive massive object. You know, so either m is big or v is big or some combination of the both. And when I multiply them together, it's much more it's much larger in magnitude than the other uh, term in the numerator. You know, if this were the case, then I could ask, does that tell me anything about what this quantity will be? And while it doesn't tell me the exact value, I do know this guy is huge relative to this guy. You know, that is what this assumption is saying. You know, it's like, example, you know, if I wanted to use a scalar example, you know, if I had a billion dollars and I added to it a penny, I more or less essentially have a billion dollars still. You know, a big number plus a very small number is approximately the same thing as just having the original big number still. You know, again, uh, you know, and the same thing if I were to take stuff away too. If I have a billion dollars and you took away a dollar, I essentially still have a billion dollars since one billion is much, much bigger than just unity. So in this case, I could say if the momentum of one object is much, much greater than the other momentum, then the final velocity of the two, once they stick together, is approximately the big guy on top divided by the sums of the masses. In other words, you know, it's this quantity involving the masses, m1 divided by the sum of the masses times the velocity of the object that had more momentum to begin with. So the when they both stick together, they move in the same direction as the original object that had the most momentum. And that kind of intuitively makes sense. You know, if you are running towards a truck and a truck is, is careening towards you, you know, after the collision, chances are you're both going to be moving in the same direction as the truck. Because it had much more momentum going into the collision than you did, since it has so much more mass and, li and likely was moving at a faster velocity compared to you. Okay, so, yeah, so sometimes these equations can be nice because you can qualitatively look at them and try to make sense of what is going on. So let's do the same thing with elastic collisions. Again, the constraint that, con that energy is conserved is nice, but it makes the math a little bit more complicated because you are saying um, not only is, you know, during a collision that this is true, that two particles collide, they might have some initial mass, or sorry, some initial velocity and some final, and some, sorry, but I'm staring over. So you have two particles that collide. They both have some initial velocity, V1 naught and V2 naught, you know, and after the collision, you know, if it's an elastic collision, um, you could actually show that they can't stick together in that case. Um, if energy is to be conserved, uh, then they both likely bounce off one another or move together in some way. I, um, at some final velocities, v1 final and v2 final. Um, and that's not too bad, but then when you throw on top of this, that you also have to make sure this is satisfied. Especially because this is a scalar expression that does not involve vectors where the top guy is a vector expression, so there is a vector equation. So if this was a three-dimensional problem, there's actually four equations I've written down here, three for the momentum and then one for the energy. And you have to make sure that all four of those equations are satisfied if the, if the um, collision is elastic, or you have four equations that you can solve for to get the quantities that are unknown. So the math can get a little trickier. Uh, but this, but in general, this is the general constraint. You know, this must be satisfied for any, for the most general case, where you have some v1, m1, moving at some speed, and you might have v2, m2. Maybe they're on a collision course, maybe not. And then afterwards, you know, they are moving 
at some new velocities. So in this case, your book goes through a couple of examples where it looks at some of the um, special cases where writing down the, the math, actually, I think it actually might, oh yeah, it does actually, it actually goes through the whole bulk problem. I'm not gonna do the math again, you could just look it up in the book. Um, but let's just look at uh, one example where we can compare this back to, unfortunately, we don't have the air track right now or else we would do this with the air track, but try to remember the first lecture we did momentum when we had the air track. Uh, so this is the case of, so let's do the special case where, where one of the objects is initially stationary. So you have some object moving in to some object that is not moving. And then they collide. And the question is, what happens? What happens afterwards? You know, once they collide, both will likely have some non-zero velocity. What direction do? What direction is that velocity in? And what is its magnitude? And so your book shows that you can, you know, in that case, the algebra becomes a little bit more simpler. And this is all for 1D, so I'm again going to drop the vector subscripts where for the initial guy that came in and hit the stationary guy, its final velocity is equal to you know, the difference of the masses divided by the sums of the masses times its initial velocity. And then the second guy, it gets, it's collided. You know, so M2 was the one that was stationary originally. M1 collides with it. And the velocity of the second guy is some, some quantity involving just the masses times the original velocity of the person of the object that hit it. Let me erase this. So again, it might be unclear how we can gain any sort of intuition or any sort of knowledge from these seeming some from these slightly more complicated expressions. But again, we could look at limits or extreme limits and see what's going on here. So one example is equal masses. You know, a case like this could be you hit a cue ball towards the eight ball on a pool table. They are they are the same mass, they are equivalent balls. You know, one of and the cue ball hits the eight ball head on. What is the final velocity of the cue ball and the eight ball if you hit it you know, perfectly straight on and not at, not glancing the ball at an angle. So in the case of equal masses, you can see um, the cue ball, which was V1. The cue ball, the one that was originally moving, has a final velocity of zero because the numerator here, if they're equal masses, then the mass of the cue ball minus the mass of the eight ball is zero. And then the velocity of the eight ball or the object that was initially stationary, you can see in that case is just um, V1 naught. Because in that case, the denominator, since they're both of equal mass, that's just equal to two, this is just equal to two M, but this is just two M. So then the whole thing in parentheses cancels out and you just get that the final velocity is just the original velocity of the first guy. So the, the cue ball comes in, hits the eight ball, the cue ball comes to rest, the eight ball moves on with the original velocity that the cue ball had. So the entire, all of the cue ball's momentum is transferred to the eight ball in this case. And since this is an, if we treat this as an elastic collision, um, all the kinetic energy is also transferred to the eight ball as well. And we and we saw this with the uh, air track as well. When I threw two, when I threw an object of the same mass towards another one that was stationary, you know, the collider came to rest, and the thing that was collided that got was collided with, you know, moved on with the roughly original velocity of the first guy.
All right, so now let's do another case where M1 is much, much greater than M2. So this could be the case of, again, I'm sorry to use such a dark example of a truck hitting you on the side of the road. So a, lar a very large object is moving and hits a very a object that has much less mass, like, you know, a truck hitting a person. <laughs> Um, in that case, then, what do we see? So in that case, then, the final velocity of the big guy, or the truck, in this case, it is just m1 minus m2 over the sums of the masses times the initial velocity of the truck. But if I look just at the numerator, this is the mass of the truck minus the mass of the tiny object. Um, so again, this is another example of if I have a billion dollars and I take away a penny, I still essentially have a billion dollars. So I can approximate this top guy, M1 minus M2, is essentially just M1, since M1 is so big. So then this is just M1 over M1 plus M2 times V, not I. But then I could do the same thing for the denominator. M1 plus M2 is essentially just M1. You know, a billion dollars plus a penny is still just a billion dollars. So then it just becomes m1 divided by m1. Those cancel out. The final velocity in this case is just essentially equal to the original velocity. The fact that it ran, that the truck ran into something had no impact on its overall momentum and speed. And then you can see that the velocity of the final, the final velocity of the smaller object in this case, I'll leave you to show it's approximately two times its mass divided by the big guy's mass times the original velocity. And again, since M2 is so much bigger than M1, this ratio out here in front is essentially zero. You know, it's like one divided by a billion. That's essentially a number very, very close to zero. So in this case, this is um, uh, <coughs> So in that case, the, uh, actually that does not seem right. Uh, what, did, what did I make a mistake on? Oh, that's why. Ignore everything I just said. I'm skipping to the next problem. So in the case, so again, sorry about that, ignore that. Um, so then if I want to ask the velocity of the smaller object, again, with M1, so I mixed up M1 and M2, which one is big, which one is small. So again, I would still say this is 2m1, but now in this case I would say it's divided by the mass of the bigger object, so this is m1, m1 plus m2, it just becomes the mass of the big guy, which is m1 times the initial velocity. So then 2m1 divided by m1 is just 2, so then this just all becomes 2, the initial velocity of the big guy. So the, so the big guy runs into the small guy. The small guy more or less moves forward at, at roughly twice the velocity that the original guy has. So it gets flung forward ahead of the truck, which is moving essentially at, at its original velocity. And then finally, You know, then the case of M1 is much, much less than M2. So this could be the example of, say, a small ball being thrown against a wall. You know, the wall has much more mass than the small ball. And we could ask, you know, during, you know, so the tiny guy is the thing that's originally moving. It collides with a much bigger guy that is stationary. What does that do in terms of the final velocities? So in this case, uh, I leave it to you to show that the final velocity of the thing that was originally moving, the small guy that was originally moving, you know, the m1 minus m2 is essentially minus m2 in the numerator, then m1 plus m2 is essentially m2 in the denominator times v1, its original speed rather, so the m's cancel, and then that just becomes negative its original velocity.
So essentially the object rebounds with the original speed it had when it collides with the object. So for the example of a ball hitting a wall, the ball bounces back away from the wall at the same speed that it had originally. And then the speed of the much bigger guy that was originally stationary, in this case it is 2m1 divided by m2 b not i. Where in this case, again sorry, again in this case, since M2 is the big guy and M1 is the small guy, this ratio is very, very small. So this thing is essentially zero. So that says that this, this guy here is essentially zero. You know, again, it'd be like throwing, throwing a marble against the building. The marble itself has some momentum when it goes into the collision, but it's not going to really be able to do anything to move the building. So the building will continue to have essentially zero momentum and the marble will bounce back um, in the opposite direction with the same speed it had going in, if the collision was elastic. All right. So again, that's, a, that's an example. Again, I would say do not, do not memorize these equations because um, again, this was just the application of the conservation conservation of momentum ugh, the conservation of momentum plus the conservation of energy all used together and they were just the result of algebra combining these two two constraints um, usually in the problem in any problem that will be given in class you know you'll have an inform information where you don't have to go through all the messy algebra and it'll be a, a little bit more straightforward So at this point, I was going to have us break into groups and actually solve one or two problems. So let me just solve one or two um, here, and then I will move on to center of mass. So here we're going to do the case where you have a block of wood suspended from a string. The block of wood is 5.4 kilograms. You have a small uh, you know, blob of clay or something that you shoot towards the block of wood. It's about 95 grams or so. so. 0.095 kilogram or about nine yeah 9.5 grams so nine point or 0.095 kilograms the blob of clay once it hits the block of wood uh, sticks to the block so it's a completely inelastic collision since it's being suspended by a string that causes the block to start to swing like a pendulum and it swings up and changes its vertical height h so it rises into the air 6.3 centimeters or 0.063 meters. And the question is, what was the original velocity of the blob of clay? Oops. Um, in order to achieve this result. Now, if I look at this, I could just imagine doing this in practice. This would take place over probably a few seconds. So a good period of time has passed. So I'd be, I'd have to really make sure that there are no external forces acting on the system if I wanted to use this as the initial state and this is the final state and use something like conservation momentum. And if I did so, that would be incorrect, because if this is a block hanging from a string, that it is hanging, presumably because of gravity, you know, gravity is acting on the block of wood this entire time, you know, during this entire process, which means if I defined my system as block plus a uh, blob of clay, there is an external force on the system, gravity, that has plenty of time to act on the system as it goes from perfectly vertical to um, 
stationary, you know, once it's risen up a height of 6.3 centimeters. So it, the block started at rest, you know, had, had some non-zero velocity, moved up to this position, then came back to rest, which again is the result of gravity in this case. Uh, so using the conservation of momentum would not be wise uh, to go from start to finish here. which is similar to what you had to do on the homework problems, where you could always use conservation momentum, you know, between two instances. In this case, I would say the best thing to do is to identify that this problem can be broken up into two stages. You know, stage one, I would call, the, I would say, is the collision of clay with the block. You know, that occurs over a very short amount of time. It makes sense that at that point, during that very brief collision where the blob of clay comes in contact with the block, I can apply the conservation momentum there. And then there's stage two, where the block movement uh, swings upward. until it comes to rest. So this might sound, this might seem familiar because we did this when we did conservation of energy. And indeed, in this case, then the only force acting on the system is a conservative force. So I can use the conservation of energy once the block plus clay swings um, like a pendulum and rises up vertically um, a distance of 0 0.063 meters. And then during this brief interaction, I can use the conservation of momentum in order to get what is the initial kinetic energy of the blob um, plus the block as it begins to swing. All right, so in this case, I would say you know, step one, what does that tell me? Again, this is all, um, I'll put some, you know, if I say to the right is positive and up is positive, then, you know, the block and the blob, if I say the blob, which is little m, has some initial velocity v, uh, which is actually what we're trying to figure out. This is actually, you know, what we ultimately want to solve for at the end of the day plus the mass of the block times its original speed, which was zero. In this case, that is equal to, you know, if I'm looking just at the collision, and that brief interaction right um, during the collision, and I said it was completely inelastic. So then at the end of the day, um, it, they move away together with some final velocity um, and their, and their total momentum is the sum of the masses times that velocity. Stage two says that when the block is at the lowest point, or the block plus clay, it has some kinetic energy, uh, one half the sum of the masses times you know, the velocity it has at the lowest point squared. If I define it, the original height of the two objects as my reference level, then by conservation of energy, that is equal to the kinetic energy of the two when it's at its highest point plus mg y, but in this case, the mass is the sum of the two masses, g is still g, and the amount of vertical distance that the object has traveled is just h. Now, if we're solving for the case where the object comes to rest after it rises up a vertical height of 6.3 centimeters, then the velocity at the highest point is zero, which makes this entire that entire first term go away, so I can get rid of that. 
So in that case, that what conservation of energy is saying is, is one half little m plus big M v at the lowest point squared equals little m plus big M gh. Notice in this case, both have the masses cancel again. And then the velocity at the lowest point, you know, right when the two objects start to move upward or swing upward is a square root of 2gh. Now, the nice thing here is I know what 2 is, I know what g is, I know what h is, I could actually get a number for this. Now where this now again are we done? No, because we wanted to find the original velocity of the blob of clay right before it hit the block. What we just found is the initial velocity of the block and the blob of clay after the collision has occurred. But the connection is realizing that this velocity here is the same as this velocity here. Once the collision occurs in stage one, both of them start moving with some velocity that I called v-final, but that is the same thing as the velocity when the two objects are at the lowest point. So now I could ask, do I know everything I need? You know, I know the mass of the, of the clay. I don't know the, its initial velocity. That's what we want to find. This is just zero. I know this mass. I know this mass. I now know this final velocity because we just solved for it using conservation of energy. So then in this case, it says m v naught equals sum of the masses root 2gh, where that v naught is little m plus big M divided by little m times root 2gh, which I get about 630 meters per second, which is pretty fast. So in that case, if the blob of clay was, was shot towards the block and, they, and it lodged onto the side, um, its momentum uh, of the block plus the, plus the clay um, would, allow, would allow it to um, rise up a height of 6.3 centimeters. And we did this again by breaking the problem up into two stages, one where I could use conservation of energy and then one where I could use conservation of momentum. And often, you know, as the problems get more complicated, this will be the general strategy that you will want to try to employ. You know, can you take a more complicated problem and break it up into something where you can apply conservation laws at various stages along the way and then chain all of it together in order to get what you want? Uh, since this is a recording, let me do one more. Eh, maybe two more. Or maybe I'll just sketch this one out and let you figure it out. I'll just tell you what the answer is. Suppose you have a ball and a string. The string has length of, uh, let's see, I think I have it. Here is 70 centimeters. The ball has a mass of half a kilogram. You know, it swings in a semicircular motion, collides with a block that is stationary. It has a mass of 2.5 kilograms. And they are on a frictionless surface. The block then starts moving to the right. The ball, and if this is a completely elastic collision, the ball will then rebound to the left. And the question is to find the velocities of both the um, the ball and the ball that's attached to the string and the box. So this is an elastic collision. And I think that's all you need, other than that the ball is released initially from rest at, at, this, at this top point here.
So in that case, you know, I'll just sketch out what I would do and then I'll let you try to fill it in and see if you get the same answer. You know, if I release this top ball from rest, it will swing downward and eventually have some velocity right before it collides with the block. It will then undergo a very brief collision with the block that we are told is elastic. Therefore, then momentum and energy are conserved during that brief collision. That will send the block moving towards the right, and then the ball will rebound towards the left. So in this case, if I were to think, what can I use for various stages? I would say that stage one is the the ball swinging down from rest up to right before it uh, hits the block. And stage two is the the brief elastic collision between the ball and the block. So if I were to think, and during case one, if my system is the block and the ball, but the block really isn't doing anything, it's not moving, and it's not interacting with the ball in any, in any way, I could instead just think of my system as just the ball it is being acted on by a conservative force, gravity. So in this case, I could also use conservation of energy to get the velocity of the ball right before it collides with the uh, block. That then gives me the horizontal momentum of the ball right as it goes into the collision. And then I would use conservation of momentum plus conservation of energy because it is a, an elastic collision to get the final velocities of the two objects. Uh, yeah, in this case, actually, you could use, since one of the objects is, in, is initially stationary, you could actually use the results we had on the previous page, the general result on the previous page. Um, or it's also in your book, uh, looks like equations 9.67, 9.68, to get the final velocities. But those equations depend on the initial velocity of the object that's moving, which did, which is in this case is the ball, in which case you could get that velocity using the conservation of energy. And then if I look at my notes on my phone, I get, again, if to the right and up are positive, that the velocity of the ball final is about negative 2.47 meters per second, so negative meaning it rebounds to the left. And the final velocity of the block, I get as plus 1.23 meters per second. All right, so I'll let you try that one out on your own. But what I did want to do, um, is just do one example of a multi multiple dimension collision. Uh, but let's keep it as simple as possible. So suppose I have two equal mass objects. So this has some mass m, this also has some mass m. They are coming towards each other at an angle. So they are initially moving with some velocity v um, that is at some angle. They collide with each other at this point, at which point it is a completely inelastic collision and they move in the horizontal direction together as one with a speed that is half the uh, 
original velocity that it had, or, or half the original speed that each individual object had. Um, and it is entirely in the horizontal direction. And then the question, so the question is, in this case, what is this angle? If they're, if they're both making the same angle with the horizontal, what angle do they need to collide at that would allow them to, if they moved away together as one, which is an assumption we're making, and they have half the velocity, you know, in order for them to have half the uh, speed as they did originally, individually, what does that angle need to be? So again, is this an elastic collision? So the collision, assuming it's very brief and that there are no external forces that I have not told you about, I can always use the conservation of momentum. But again, this says that the total momentum of the system initially equals the total momentum of the system after the collision, and this is an a vector expression. So that means in the x direction, I can say that the total momentum in the x direction initially equals the total momentum in the y direction. Ugh equals the final momentum in the x direction. In the vertical direction, the total momentum in the y direction initially is, the, is equal to the final momentum in the y direction after the collision. So in this case, I have two equations um, that both must be satisfied in order to solve for this problem. Turns out for this particular problem, we actually won't need one of them. Um, because of the symmetry. Notice that in the case of the vertical direction, and again, let's define up the page as positive and to the right as positive. In this case, the initial moment, the final momentum of the system in the vertical direction is easy, it's just zero, um, because the two objects, once they come together and collide, are moving to the right, so they're moving only in the horizontal direction, they're not moving up or down, there is no velocity in the vertical direction, the final momentum in the vertical direction is zero. Um, but it turns out in this case, the initial momentum, um, whatever it is, must equal zero, uh, but it turns out it was already zero to begin with. Because if I look at the bottom mass, it is moving towards the top of the page. So it has a momentum of m v uh, sine theta. And then if I look at the top guy that is moving towards the bottom of the page, its momentum is minus m v sine theta, which just equals zero identically anyway. So all, all of this is saying is zero equals zero, which is good. We need to make sure we don't have contradictions in, in, in what we do. Um, but this did not really tell us any new information. What will be useful here is to look at the horizontal momentums. And there, uh, they clearly are not, well, they are the same on both sides, but they're not going to be identically the same on both sides. So they're actually going to allow us to solve for something. So on the right side, again, that's the easy one, I think, the final momentum is the total mass of the system times the uh, velocity of the system. But in this case, the system has just become one particle that has a mass of 2m um, and a velocity that is half the original velocity. So it's just um, the twos cancel and it's just m times v where this v is the original speed, but again, remember it's the particle is, has mass 2m and it has a speed of v over two. And then that must be equal to the initial velocity in the x direction. Uh, so in this case, if we look at, for both of the objects, they're both moving towards the right in the positive direction. So for the bottom guy, I could say this is mv cosine theta. But then for the top guy, I could also say this is mv cosine theta. So then this is just equal to 2mv 
cosine theta. Now, in order for momentum to be conserved in all directions in this case, both the x and the y direction, it's already conserved in the y direction because it just says zero equals zero. There was never any momentum to begin with in the y direction. But in the, in the horizontal direction, you know, these two things must be equal to one another. So this says that 2mv cosine of theta equals mv. The m's cancel. That says that 2 cosine equals 1 or cosine equals 1 half. Or that theta equals 60 degrees or pi over 3 radians. So if they collide um, and each make a 60 degree angle, or if there's 120 degrees uh, between the two objects, uh, the collision will result in them moving in the horizontal direction with a speed that is equal to half the speed that each particle had originally. So again, remember that when it's multiple dimensions, each dimension, um, if, conservation, if momentum conservation applies, each dimension can give you a constraint equation. Though in this case, the vertical direction did not really do anything for us. All right. Doing the problems has made this take a little bit longer, but that's okay it's a recording. So let's briefly talk about center of mass. So we saw with conservation momentum, one of the nice things about conservation momentum is that it justified that we were able to treat extended objects like point particles. You know, when I pushed on a box, I did not have to necessarily worry about all the interactions between all the atoms that make up the box, I could just treat all of them as a single massive particle with a mass that was equal to the mass of all the individual little particles that made up the box. And we saw that, you know, in the case of momentum, that was the case because all the internal interactions within the system, in that case the box, cancel each other out by Newton's third law of motion. And so we can go a little bit further um, with this idea and um, start talking about what about the dynamics of things that do not quite have, you know, quite as nice symmetries as, say, a box or a ball, which is perfectly spherically symmetrical, for example. Like if I were to throw a bat into the air where the bat has a skinny end and a fat end, is there a way that I can understand the motion of the bat as it flies through the air? Is the bat's motion the same as if it were a particle concentrated at one point? You know, when I threw a ball into the air and I could treat it as a particle or a point, we saw that the trajectory of the particle was, you know, a nice parabola. And that was chapter, uh, chapter four. So, so we saw for trajectories that there are, you know, a few simple equations that can understand that we can use to understand particles as long as we can treat the object as a particle. Yeah, but then I could ask, for example, what if I had a baton that I threw into the air and I did it in such a way that as the baton was flying through the air, it also was spinning. Is there a way that I can understand the motion of the baton, which is an extended object, you know, that is made of many, many smaller individual particles, but has some internal motion as well? In this case, the object is spinning. Um, is it still a parabola? If I looked at the trajectory of the baton, would it still trace out a parabola like we saw when it was, say, a cannonball or a ball that I was throwing into the air in the classroom? So this gets us into the idea of the center of mass. Um, and this is really just another way of looking at energy, con or sorry, momentum conservation.
it would be swell if if for extended objects it would be swell if for extended objects uh, we could we could write Newton's laws like we have been in the past. That is, rather than, rather than looking at F net on, um, each individual particle where there are, you know, trillions upon trillions of these for extended objects. It would be great if there was some way that we could write, you know, the net forces acting on an object equaling the mat the total mass of the of the object times some acceleration. Or maybe this acceleration is of the whole object, say. So that, you know, is there, under what conditions can we, um, or can we always write Newton's laws of motion for an extended object um, as just the, um, can we more or less still write it as F equals MA, but in this case for M, we replace it with the total mass of the system rather than worrying about the individual masses of all the little particles that make up the system. And if we can, in that case, what is this A that uh, I've just written down for Newton's law? And we will see that uh, this ties into something that is called the center of mass. So the net force acting on an object, I can write as just the sum of all the external forces acting on the system. Again, I can do this because of Newton's laws. You know, if I define my system to have multiple particles within it, we saw that Newton's third law cancels out all those internal interactions. So I really am only caring about the, the sum of the forces uh, that are external, uh, are acting externally from the system, on the system rather. And we saw that as the same thing as the change in the total momentum of the system as a function of time. How the total momentum of the system, how it changes as a function of time, depends on if there are is any net forces, which is why it's great when the net external force is equal to zero, then momentum is always conserved, else we have to hope we can make the impulse approximation. So then if I use this in this, exp in this expression here, this says that the time derivative of the total momentum of the, on the system which the total momentum of the system is just the sum of all the masses of the individual particles within the system times the velocities of those individual particles. So this is the masses making up the system. Uh, I can set that equal to the total mass, which I'm now going to start writing as m tote times a. And again, we want to figure out what this a is. So I can move the numerate or the denominator of the derivative to the other side. So then this just says that the rate of change of the total momentum of the system is equal to the total mass of the system times this a times dt. So this says a little bit of change in the total momentum of the system is equal to the total mass of the system times, you know, some bit of acceleration that occurs over time, you know, whatever that is. So again, I can look at the net change of all these small, tiny little changes by doing an integral. You know, adding up all these tiny changes, 
the integral and the derivative cancel each other out on the left-hand side. So this just says the total momentum of the system is equal to the integral of this guy. The total mass is presumably constant. And this is the integral of a dt. But the integral of a dt we've seen before is just the velocity. So now I have this kind of capital V uh, for the system, you know, some velocity related to the entire system, which I'm defining as just, you know, you would, we could define this capital V as the total momentum of the system divided by the total mass of the system. I could do this again, this capital V is just the same thing as some derivative of some position as a function of time. So as a result, I can say that uh, if I write then that d capital R dt equals the sum of, essentially still the sum of the momentum of the system, and this says that d capital R, whatever this capital R is, to be determined shortly, is equal to the sum of the momentum of the system times dt, Multiplication distributes over addition, so this is the same thing as the sum of the mass times v dt. You know, so every particle in the system you know, that has some velocity, and then I'm multiplying all of that by a little dt for each one of them. And that tells me the some small rate of change at, for some bulk quantity, some bulk position of the entire system. And again, I can see what all these small changes are by doing an integral. The integral also distributes over the sum. So that is the same thing as the sum of all the little integrals. This right hand, this left hand side, the derivative cancels the integral. So it's just the some position related to the position of the entire system is equal to, I feel like I've, I've lost something here. Uh, I've lost my M tote somewhere. Uh, where did you go, sir? Uh, ah, that's why. This is not just V. This is M tote times capital V. So then there's an m tote here, then there's an m tote here, then there's an m tote here, and then there's an m tote here. Sorry about that. Uh, so everything else looks good, yes. I've always looked at the units and saw that the units did not make sense. All right, so again, just to recap, um, I you know, have this bulk velocity of the system which I know a velocity is just a rate of change of a position as a function of time. So then more or less plugged that into the expression I had before, um, rearranged the derivative so that I could do an integral instead, um, which is now giving me my final answer, which is saying the total mass of the system times some position related to the total, related to the entire system is equal to the sum of the masses of the particles in the system but this is just the sum of the masses times the integrals of all the little VDTs. The integral velocity with, the, with respect to time is position. So the sum of the masses of all the particles in the system times each individual little position, you know, each individual position for all of those individual masses. So I could have, say, a position vector for all the atoms that make up a box. You know, each one of them would have their own position vector. And I could evaluate this, you know, in that case, you know, a, a ginormous sum. And I'm saying that that is equal to sum, the total mass of the system, so the sum of all the individual masses, times this new vector r. So then I'm going to call r, then it's just 1 over m total times the sum of the individual masses of all the particles within the system times the position of each of those individual particles.
And given what I've said already, R is called the center of mass. So the center of mass of uh, the center of mass of a system can be defined as the sum of the mass weighted positions of all the objects that are in the system divided by the total mass that makes up the system. This gives you a sort of weighted average of all the positions in, in the system itself. And what are you weighting it by? You're weighting it by the mass of the objects. So, an op so in a system where the mass of the object is unevenly distributed, the center of mass of the system is biased towards a location closer to where most of the mass is in the system. Finding the center of mass um, on your own with smaller objects you can hold in your hand is quite easy. This center of mass, we'll see this when we do rotation, the center of mass of a system is the point where, for example, I'm taking my, app, my pencil right now and holding it horizontally and putting my finger somewhere around the center of the, of the pencil. And I'm noticing if I do that and let go, the pencil wants to rotate and fall off my finger. But if I move it a little bit towards the heavier end of the pencil, then once I let go of the pencil, it balances perfectly on my finger. In that case, my finger has located the center of mass of the system. It is, you can think of it as the balancing point for an object. So the object where if you were to put it, if you were to balance it on your finger is the point where it would not rotate and tip over. We'll see that later in the week. But what is useful about this, um, I more or less, I started with the answer I wanted and worked backwards. Um, I think your textbook goes the other way where it defines the center of mass and then uses that to derive this result here up top. Um, but to me, it seems like that way they're kind of just, when they do it that way, it's unclear to me why that should be the definition for the center of mass. Here, I think it kind of shows you why this is a useful definition for what we call the center of mass. So let me, let me go back up here. So what this says is, This says that then F net, so then, actually, let me work into this. If R is the center of mass of the system, then this capital V we call the center of mass velocity of the system. So it's giving you a sense of how the entire system is moving as a whole. Um, so that if there are individual particles within the system and they are moving at different velocities relative to one another, you can still get a sense of how the entire system is moving as a whole based on the center of mass velocity. And then you have this capital A that we started with, we can then define as the center of mass acceleration. So a quantity that represents the acceleration of the entire system as a whole, um, which in the case of a rigid object, like a bat or a ball or a box, where there is no relative motion between the particles that make up the system, this center of mass acceleration is just then the acceleration of, say, the entire box, like we have done in problems before, or, this, or the acceleration of the ball when I threw it in the air. You know, and what I've done already in class, if I wanted to be super exact, what I really should have been saying, you know, when I threw a ball up into the air and we said it had some, ex we had a, that it had an acceleration equal to negative g, what I really should have been saying is that the center of mass acceleration of the ball had a magnitude equal to negative g. But in the case of the ball, where there was no relative motion between the particles that make up the ball, Every, ob every particle that made up the ball has the had the same acceleration, um, in that case, equal to the acceleration of the center of mass of the entire ball. So then, you know, another way of looking at um, momentum conservation in Newton's laws is when we write F external net equals now just M total times this center of mass acceleration, 
this is saying that the that the way that a system moves as a whole in order for the entire system to have any sort of bulk motion um, so not just motion relative to objects within the system but for the entire system to move like say a box to move where um, there has to be an external net force acted on by the object you know if if in the case that this is equal to zero that then says that the acceleration of the center of mass of the system is zero so that the system while individual objects in the system might be moving themselves and might be accelerating you know as they say like for the sun and the earth as they tug on each other and orbit one another you know the entire solar system as a whole for example would not would not be moving it would not or would rather would not be accelerating it would move at a the entire solar system would move at a constant velocity if it had some initial velocity or if it did not have any initial velocity, um, it would remain at rest, while the objects within the system would be accelerating and moving. So any, you know, for example, any interaction between the Earth and the Sun could not have the entire solar system or, you know, be flung, you know, out of the Milky Way. You know, it could, you know, things could happen and maybe individual objects could be flung out towards the edge of the Milky Way, but you could not have the entire system as a whole you know, move across the Milky Way just because of interactions that are occurring within the system, for example. All right, so, um, yeah, and then the last example um, of this, going back to the baton. You know, if I threw a baton into the air, and as a result, it... And while, while I did throw it into the air, it also had some rotation so that it rotated as it flew through the air. You know, in the case of a baton where it was two balls um, attached to a uniform rod, your intuition um, can probably pick up that the center of mass in that case would be you know, in the center of the rod in between the two balls. So the center of mass would be, would be in the mid, I did not draw that one very good. It would be in the middle of the rod in between the two balls, assuming the balls were the same size and that the rod was uniform in mass throughout. And so what this is saying, what F external net equals M tote A center of mass is saying is that when you throw an object into the air that's an extent object like a baton or a bat, even if it has some relative motion between the particles within the system, where again the system is just the baton, like in the case where the baton is rotating while it's thrown into the air, you could still analyze the motion of the baton by treating it like a single particle where all the mass of the entire baton is located at the center of mass of the system in this case, halfway between the two balls on, on the rod. And in that case, you can treat the overall motion of the baton not taking into account its rotation. You know, Even though it's rotating while it's moving, it would still move in a parabolic trajectory um, where it would come up, reach its highest point, and come back down. And it would be the same trajectory as if um, all, the, uh, all the mass of the baton were concentrated at one point. Um, that particular point being the center of mass of the baton. Again, as just the one over the total mass of the system times the sum of the masses of the individual particles making up the system times their position vectors. Which can be pretty useful. And again, this is just another way of justifying why I have not had to take into account all the internal interactions and all the little things that have been going on inside the objects when I threw an extended object into the air. I could have also done it with a bat or a baton, and even though the motion would have looked a little different, you know, if you would have taken a, you know, a rapid photograph of, of the baton or the bat as it flew through the air, you would still see that the overall path it traces out, even if the object is rotating while it's moving in the air, the overall path the object traces out would still be the same parabolic trajectory that we saw in chapter four. And this actually, I was gonna, I would have shown this on some slides. I would recommend just Google imaging like center of mass for a 
flying bat or rotating baton or something like that. And you'll find images uh, from physics websites and whatnot that will show you um, exactly what, what I'm talking about here, where the center of mass of the system, you'll see traces out the same parabolic trajectory that we learned about in chapter four, um, even though the object itself is rotating while it's doing so. So that's pretty useful because you can treat objects, you can treat extended objects as if they're just a particle um, that has a mass equal to the total mass of the system um, and is located at the center of mass. And then the center, the path of the center of mass is the same as if it was just a particle, which is more or less what we've been treating everything like so far. This in, in a way is justifying that that was not completely absurd in doing so. And again, this is a vector equation. So when I say the center of mass, this is really saying the center of mass in the x direction plus the center of mass in the y direction, if I use the ijk notation, plus the center of mass in the uh, z direction. Um, so you could use, you know, since this is a vector equation, you could use this and evaluate the sum for each dimension individually, and that gives you the center of masses in each dimension, and then the vector sum gives you the uh, multi-dimensional center of mass for an extended object that might exist in multiple dimensions. So let's do a couple examples, and then we will and then we will be done. Oh God! All right, so let's let's actually just do the baton. Suppose I have a baton that has two um, balls on either end that, ha that both have a mass m. They're connected by a massless rod that has length l. So the rod has negligible mass. There are two balls on either end. Each has a mass m. The question is, where is the center of mass? And I've, and I've put it nicely along the horizontal direction so we don't have to worry about multi-dimensions. It's just a one-dimensional problem. Your intuition probably says that it lies right at the center. And we will see that is indeed the case. So in this case, I could say the center of mass is again one over m total, plus the sum of the individual masses of that make up the system times the position vectors of each one of those masses. Since I really only have to worry about the x direction. I'll just make this a scalar equation. m total is just the mass of ball one plus the mass of ball two, so it's two m. The sum of the masses um, is pretty easy, and then the sum of the mass times the positions is also pretty easy. So notice I put this one conveniently at the origin, so it's the mass of that guy times zero plus the mass times the position of the second guy, so the mass of that guy, times its x position, which is just L. So in that case, then, this becomes M L over 2 M, or L over 2. I think as we all expected. And when things are one-dimensional, that's really nice. But what if I had what if I had three particles that made up a an equilateral triangle? That looks like that. You know, relative to a coordinate system I've lied down. You know, in this case then I have you know position vector R1 position vector R2, position vector R3. And then if I wanted to evaluate in each one of these, I guess I should technically be writing these as vectors. You know, R1, for example, has some X coordinate and some Y coordinate, R2, et cetera, et cetera, for R3. So then if I wanted to evaluate the center of mass, I could do, you know, this again is the general expression, one over m total, sum of the masses times the position vectors. 
but I could do this in each dimension. So the center of mass in the x direction would be one over m total. Then it would be m1 times the, the horizontal position of m1, m2, x2 plus m3, x3. And then the y center of mass would be similar. And sometimes you can use symmetry, which is nice um, to evaluate these things. Like your intuition with the you know, with the symmetric baton, you know, whenever symmetry can help you, definitely make use of symmetry. All right, and then last but not least, I just want to introduce this because you will see this a lot in physics three, though you will not. We will see this a little bit. Um, in physics one, uh, but you'll actually have to do this in physics three. What if instead, instead of a bunch of individual particles, I had a continuous object? So, you know, take the triangle from the previous example, but instead of the three points making up, making up the tips, suppose it's instead a uniform triangle that is, you know, filled in, you know, that is just a solid 2D object and I wanted to find the center of mass for this uh, continuous distribution of mass, where in, in this case, you know, there are, you know, if this were an actual object in nature, you know, there are trillions upon trillions of little individual, uh, individual um, atoms that make this up. You know, each one of them have some tiny amount of mass, dm, um, and each one of them have some position, r, but there are trillions and trillions of these guys, so how can we calculate the center of mass in that case? Well, given that I used uh, dm, that probably is a clue of where, of where we are going with this. So in this case, for a continuous distribution, the center of mass position is, again, I could just define as m tot times the sum of each individual tiny little mass that's in the system times the position vector. But in this case, each little mass is a very, very tiny amount of mass, a little tiny little dm, um, a little bit of mass that makes up, you know, the system here compared to uh, a mass here and here and here and here and, you know. And if I wanted to find using the, using the sum, I could just, you know, do a sum that, ha that adds up all of these individual tiny little particles. Um, and that would give me the center of mass for this continuous distribution of matter. Or, of course, we could make use of the fact that in the limit that, the, that this little differential piece of mass is very small, I could very effectively approximate this as 1 over m tot times the integral of the position vector uh, times dm. And actually, let me copy this over and then put a box around this. So this is for a continuous distribution of matter. Which again is just the calculus way of saying calculate the total mass of the system and it's then one over the total mass of the system times the this sum of a bunch and bunch of very very tiny terms of just the position of the position times the tiny amount of mass for every tiny particle that makes up this continuous distribution of uh, matter. Then you just add them all up and that gives you the center of mass for a continuous distribution. So again, it's always nice to see this in practice at least once. You know, so take, for example, the uniform rod. Oops. 
So a rod that has some length L, but now I'm not just work, and it's not just the baton where it's the two balls with a massless rod in the center. I can just say it's the rod itself without the two balls that make up the endpoints. And it is a uniform rod. with total mass M, capital M, and length, capital L. And the question is, where is the center of mass for this rod? Now again, your intuition is probably telling you that it's halfway in the middle of the rod. We will see that is correct, but it's always nice to see that the math justifies um, what our intuition says. This also allows me to introduce the idea of density, um, which you will have to use definitely in Physics 3 um, and maybe a little bit here in Physics 1. So again, if we wanted to evaluate this integral, since it's just a one, it's just one dimensional, so rather than talking about the vector of our center of mass, I'll just say x center of mass is 1 over the total mass of the system, which we said was just m, times the integral of now it's not just r but it's just x dm because i only have to worry about the x position um, i don't have to worry about uh, the y or the z but this integral right now is not quite as useful as it could be because here it says i'm integrating over mass um, usually for something that there is some spatial distribution of matter here so the mass is distributed from zero all the way up to l it'd be nice if i could integrate over length instead of you know so dl or dx in this case rather than dm so we need to make a substitution that allows us to change this into an integral that is an integral over length rather than an integral over mass and the way to do that is to is to appreciate that you know if I were to break up this rod into a bunch of tiny little mass segments, each of them over some length, little dx, uh, right, this length here is dx, each of them has some little bit of mass dm. And then if I add up all those tiny little pieces of mass, I get the total mass, capital M. And that's extended over the entire length, L. So for uniform... For uniform objects, I can talk about the density of the object. And you have likely seen the word density before. You know, the density of water, for example, is one gram per cubic centimeter. Um, density is often talked about in terms of volumes. So usually, you know, you see something like mass per volume. You know, for a 3D density. Where it's how is the mass distributed over, in this case, a 3D space? You know, three dimensions of space is a volume. So the density of water being one gram per cubic centimeter means that for every little cubic centimeter of water, um, it has a mass equal to one gram. It's telling you how the mass is distributed over, in this case, the volume. The density really is, you know, it's a more general idea it's just telling you how in this case mass and in, in physics 3 it'll tell you about how you know you can talk about things like charge density how is charge distributed over a surface or over a rod or over a sphere you know whatever whatever the problem is so you can talk about a 1d density you know i could call it say lambda which is mass over length so again how the mass of the object is distributed over, in this case, a 1D space. So in this case, it would have units of, say, kilograms per meter, you know, in the case of a 1D density. I guess it's just mass per length rather than mass per volume. So in the case of this particular problem, since it is a uniform density, that says no matter where I am on the rod, you know, th there's the same amount of mass over the same amount of distance. Um, so, you know, the entire mass of the rod divided by the entire length of the rod. Um, and, you know, in general, this would just be an average density. But in the case of a uniform object or where the, the mass is uniformly distributed, this actually is the actual density of the system. So 
at every point along the rod, the density of mass at that point is just the total mass divided by the length. This is telling you how the mass is distributed over the entire rod. You can also kind of argue this out intuitively. You know, if this, this I said is the total, the over the entire rod has a total mass M over the entire length of the rod L. You can also think for a uniform rod, that also would mean if I only looked over half the rod, which then had half the mass, but it's only over half the length, notice it still gives you the same density. If I looked over a, you know, a 1% of the rod, uh, I would be looking over one half of the length of the rod. For a uniform rod, that still gives you the same density. In all of these cases, I still get the same m divided by l. So if you could imagine, I go to even smaller and smaller and smaller. So rather than two, rather than a hundred, you know, a billion, a trillion, a trillion, trillion, this gets to the point where I'm talking about tiny little pieces of mass or tiny little pieces in length, which in this case is just x, since we're integrating over x. So I could use this, I could say dm is the density of the object times the length of the object. And I can use this as my substitution. Again, we will not see this very much in physics one, but I know other professors have introduced it now because you will see it again a lot in physics three and we'll actually have to use it to solve problems in physics three. In this case then, you know, just to finish this off, x center of mass is one over the total mass times the integral of x. But now instead of dm, I'm going to say it's lambda times dx. So now I've turned this integral into a integral over length because whatever it comes after the d is what you're integrating over. The lambda is a constant, so that comes out. So this is an integral of x dx. My limits of integration are I'm starting at x equals 0, I'm ending at x equals l. The constants just go along for the ride. The antiderivative of x is x squared over 2. Again, you would always check this by taking the derivative and seeing that the derivative gives you back, gets you back what's in the center. Remember, for integrals, I evaluate the antiderivative at the endpoint and subtract it from the antiderivative evaluate at the initial point. So this is lambda over m just times l squared over two. Because more or less I plug in l wherever I see an x and then I subtract the same expression but I plug in a zero where I see an x. So plugging in zero just makes it turn to zero. So then this tells me that the center of mass is this clunky expression. Now if I look at the units of the expression, it does have units of distance, but it's not quite very, it's not as helpful as it could be. So I could use my definition of density and actually just substitute it in. So the density is just m over l. So wherever I see lambda, I could plug in m over l. And notice in that case then, this just becomes L over two. Again, what we, I think, intuitively had, had expected, um, but allows us to uh, see that the, the more formal definition of center of mass gives us the right answer. All right, that was a lot. Um, took some extra time because the problem solving, which would have been done in groups, um, I had to go through each one individually. Um, so I apologize for the length. Uh, and I will see you on Wednesday.